And, and now that we're getting started, before I hand things over to tonight's speaker, I do want to first start by thanking Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors, and they are White Mountain Oil and Propane, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and Hancock Lumber. So I do want to thank them for their financial support that allows us to uh, continue putting on our programs. In addition, I want to thank all of you who are watching right now who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Your membership dollars go to helping us fulfill our mission and to put on these programs. So thank you, thank you, thank you um, for choosing to support us. And if you're not a Tin Mountain member currently, I would encourage you to consider doing so. Um, on our website in the top right-hand corner, there is a support us tab right on tinmountain.org. Um, and there is membership information there, as well as just uh, if membership isn't right for you right now, there's also information on um, just donating directly to our nature program series, which helps us continue, um, continue our series. And in along those lines, um, for our remaining May programs, um, next Thursday, another virtual program, um, because it's May and May is all about birds. Um, we have Harry Vogel from the Loon Preservation Committee. He will be presenting on the state of uh, state of the loon here in New Hampshire. That will be on um, next Thursday evening. I believe that's the 26th, um, and that will be at seven o'clock. The link will be available on our website. And then the following Saturday will be our final um, final birding in the bog weekend. So two great birding programs um, coming up in addition to, as I said before, birding in the bog um, this coming weekend. Um, so lots of programs. You can get information about those as well as um, you know, our June and July programs at our website, tinmountain.org. Um, before I hand things over to tonight's presenter, um, I did just want to take a um, for anyone who's not been with us for a while, um, or you know, if this is the first time, just a reminder of Zoom etiquette. Um, if you have a question for Chris, the best way to, uh, to ask that is to type it directly into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be monitoring that chat. If it's an immediate clarifying question, I can pop in um, and, and ask that of Chris. Otherwise, I will hold those questions until the end and read through them at which point you're also welcome to unmute yourself and, um, and ask questions directly of Chris. So lots of options. Um, I believe everyone was muted when you entered um, and we do ask that you stay muted just so that we don't pick up any, uh, any unintended background noise um, that might distract other individuals. <sighs> and that's my, that is my song and dance. So. Um, you know, I, I am very happy to introduce Chris Louie um, of Raven Interpretive Programs, a uh, longtime birder, a former board member of Tin Mountain, an all around good guy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Chris. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nora. And uh, Nora just got me out of a jam here. We had a little technical difficulty <laughs> at the last at the last minute, and she solved uh, solved the problem. Uh, so I'm not really Zoom savvy. Um, so, but we'll uh, we'll get through this. I just want to know how I can permanently mute Howie Weems. Is there some way I can do that? If he if he gives you trouble, <laughs> I can remove him from the program. Remove him completely. Okay. Yes, I, uh, I will can... remove. I, I can't see everyone that's here, but uh, but we'll uh, we'll progress. And I really don't mind being interrupted at all if you have any any questions, and Nora will uh, facilitate uh, that. But uh, I'm I'm excited about this program. Kind of a, a, a preface to a puff and trip that we've done annually for um, the last seven years. Um, with a, a couple of couple of year break uh, for COVID, and we're excited to be uh, back on board the Hardy boat uh, again this June. That's it's hard to believe, but that's 
that's coming up in um, just about a month from a month from now. Um, so what I'd like to do. Uh, So I want to I want to just just take a look at what is going on there, and um, in, even if if you're not going to go out on the boat, it's a lot uh, a lot more comfortable to um, see it from your living room here. So um, let's let's take a look at the uh, at the main coast here, and there we go. So the main coast, as many of you know, uh, we're we're really close. We're only about sixty miles from uh, from Portland. Um, here where we are in, in New Hampshire. And it's a uh, varied terrain. Uh, the coast is uh, uh, well over 3,000 miles, depending upon how you measure it. Some people think it's closer to 5,000 miles of coastline, um, which would pretty much uh, make it a longer coastline than the rest of the United States uh, combined. Um, many of you are familiar with this, uh, with this type of a scene here. This uh, is rock covered with, uh, with lichen. This is uh, one of those Xanthoria lichens. There are about 11 species uh, in Maine and they're all nitrophilic, uh, which means they have, um, they, they have a tendency to, uh, to need nitrogen. So we, where do we get nitrogen? We get nitrogen um, um, uh, mostly along the coast from uh, bird guano. It's uh, nitrogenous waste is broken down um, material from human systems. So this is a good indication. We have a lot of bird life along the coast of coast of Maine when you see uh, Xanthoria like, uh, like this. And any coastline, you're gonna find that it's a prolific area for, for many life forms. And particularly in the, the main coast, you can actually see how uh, life uh, could have started out of the ocean, taking a, just a, a quick, run up over the land and back into the into the sea and this is obvious if you spend any time um, working some of the tide pools along the along the coast this is uh laurie might remember this this is this was a, a tide pool from a, a marine uh research course that i took back in graduate school and uh, we had two tide pools to study and this was I named this Fenway Park, that one right in the middle there, and we monitored it for a, monitored it for a, for a week or so. And it's just amazing. If you haven't done this, it's a great thing to do to get over to the coast. Uh, Two Light State Park has great tide pools, and you really get a feel. And that's what this is all about: the study of natural history. You get a feel for for where we fit in, how how life is going on all all around us, and of course the smaller parts of of um, the marine environment work up to some of the larger uh, marine mammals and harvest seals are very, very common along the, uh, the, main, uh, the main coast. And we easily could see them from, uh, from the hardy boat. Uh, also, we have uh, benthic creatures, creatures that dwell on the bottom of the ocean that feed on whatever's, uh, whatever's coming down uh, towards them. And that's quite, uh, the lobster in industry is, is really a huge industry in the um, and this uh, this limited habitat is really um, is really made use of by a number of species of birds that really need uh, sandy areas to, to nest in. Um, some of you might have been over to the uh, York area. There's a lease nesting turn uh, colony there. They need sandy, uh, sandy uh, areas in order to nest, along with um, piping plovers, another shorebird that's endangered that, um, that you can find along, uh, along uh, the southern coast, of, southern coast of, of Maine. The lease turn is, uh, believe it or not, our smallest turn. Um, where it gets its name, and it's uh, very easy to uh, to pick out um, if you get a good look by its white forehead. Uh, so these birds would not nest on an island like Eastern Egg Lock, Rock with a rocky coast. They would nest on a sandy uh, sandy area, which presents other problems for them, as they um, they have to deal with um, 
summer uh, sunbathers. And uh, so that's, uh, that's always an issue. Um, this is one of the turns that we'll find out on Eastern Egg, uh, egg Rock. Uh, this is the Arctic, Arctic turn. And uh, there's a, a strong colony out on, uh, out on egg, egg Rock. This is another one of the turns that we'll be able to find on Egg Rock. This is the Roseate turn. It's ghostly white, um, long streamers. Um, that really help with identification. We have a tough time on the boat, on the puffin trip, identifying the turns because the boat is moving quite a bit and the turns are in flight and they're very similar, but we do our best to, to, uh, to pick them out. We have three species on Eastern Egg Rock, um, three species of terns that are nesting there. We have the roseate tern, as you see um, here, and we have the Arctic tern and the common tern. Also talking about uh, what type of life we're gonna find along the main coast. If you just go off a short distance in a larger boat out into the pelagic area, um, you can see a variety of, of, um, of seabirds that just patrol the North Atlantic. It's so exciting to get an opportunity to do that. And um, there are some organizations that do uh, pelagic trips off the, off the coast of Maine, often in the fall where you get both the Northern and Southern uh, species of, uh, of birds. We used to do a trip, and I bet some of you that are here tonight, um, uh, Laura, you might have been on it, I'm not sure. We used to do a trip on the old Scotia Prince. Some of you might have remembered, left Portland and went for 12 hours to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And we used to do a birding pelagic trip overnight. We'd get on board at eight o'clock at night in Portland and travel overnight to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, never get off the boat, and we would come back and bird the um, uh, the 200 plus miles of uh, of North Atlantic uh, coast and see quite a variety of of uh, birds that make their living out on the North Atlantic. Also uh, off the coast of Maine, you're likely to see fin whales and humpbacks, um, huge huge leviathans that um, that come into the Gulf of Maine to uh, to feed, and also. Um, some of the pelagic birds you could see uh, the northern gannet is one of the uh, one of the big stars you see them from the coast when they get blown in and they nest further north they they nest up on the gas bay peninsula and further north and some of you might have been up to see these seabirds nesting so any bird that's out in the north atlantic out over the water has to come to shore in order to nest and many of you are familiar with the gulls that we have along the main coast we have uh, uh, gulls that nest throughout the season, throughout the breeding season on the shore, uh, on the mainland shore of the coast and also on the islands off, off the coast. The islands off the coast, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, have, um, have some advantages to, uh, to nesting and that draws a lot of these, uh, these uh, gulls to, to nest there. Herring gull, very common gull, uh, probably the most common gull uh, that we have on the on the main coast. Um, just a, a wonderful um, coastline bird, really uh, attractive birds. They they get a terrible reputation because they moved inland a little bit and fed on um, on some of our dumps, our landfills that uh, have been mostly cleaned up now. And then the largest gull in the world, uh, the great blackback gull. This is, uh, this is really a huge predator, a massive, handsome gull, large enough that they can feed on an entire adult puffin, uh, swallow them whole, and that's an issue with, um, with egg rock. So this is a gull nest. I can't remember if it's a herring gull or a, a blackback gull. They're both nesting in the area, and the, the way to tell uh, if um, you pick up one of these eggs if you can put your, your index finger and you together around the egg, then it's a herring gull. And a little bit larger, you can't close your finger and thumb and it's a black back gull. Um, this particular gull, I took this picture because I thought it was interesting. This, this nest had a rock in it. And I thought how smart they are um, if they plan that because the rock would help stabilize the temperature, it would heat up and then if the gull was off for any period of time, it would still provide some heat for the, um, for the eggs. So I don't know if that was intentional or not. I have found um, nests that didn't have 
rocks in them. And I found other nests that did have rocks in them. So I thought that was that was uh, pretty uh, pretty clever. And the islands off the coast of Maine are successful at putting out a lot of gull chicks. Well, why is this? Why is the 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 um, Gulf of Maine, the Maine coast, so prolific in um, in its abundance of of wildlife. Well, if um, if you think for a minute of uh, the currents, we you, all, we're all very familiar with with the Gulf Stream. Water is warmed up by the sun down in the Gulf of Mexico, and it comes down around the peninsula of Florida and heads up our coast. It varies somewhat, but typically that's the path that it takes. And it heads right up and is forced off the coast uh, just about at Massachusetts. You can see the arm of Massachusetts comes out and that forces the Gulf Stream up and over towards Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia has um, many interesting sightings of birds that you would expect to find much further south because they are very much influenced by the by the Gulf Stream, as is Europe. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting for us to, to think about our latitudes. And I always have it in my head that uh, the latitude of, of the UK and us of similar weather, it's about the same latitude. But Atlantic. Now, of course, when any water goes up in that direction, water has to come down. And what we find is the Labrador current hugs the coast. You can see hugs the, the southeastern coast of Nova Scotia and comes down. And of course, is still forced by the Gulf Stream to hug the coast. And it goes up into the Gulf of Maine. You could make the argument that the Gulf of Maine is not really the North Atlantic. It's a totally separate body of water. It's like a big mill pond with circulating water around it or underneath it. And you can see the arrows. Um, uh, you can you, you can see those arrows right in this uh, this slide. We're on on track here. Tom, you awake? I'm watching. I'm watching you. Okay, good. So the water goes up into the Bay of Fundy and comes down along our coast and then swirls there. This is cold, oxygen rich, nutrient rich water. And that's what is the basis of all of the life that we find in the Gulf of Maine. Very different, you find di very different species of organisms south of Massachusetts, whole different, whole different ball game. Um, and that's one reason why um, we can have puffins nesting this far south. So let's take a look at um, what we're talking about. The southernmost nesting population of the Atlantic puffin. Um, can, you, can you see this uh, red dot here? That's Eastern Egg Rock. New Harbor is where our boat will leave from. Some of you I'm sure are familiar with this island out here. This is Muscongus Bay. And the outermost island in Muscongus Bay is Monhegan Island. Laurie and I have spent um, many days out on, uh, on Monhegan. It's just a just a great, a great place. So we have Brunswick over here, up Route 1, and then you come down from Damariscotta, you come down the peninsula through Bristol down to New Harbor. And New Harbor is the, there are other boats that go out to see the puffins on, on Egg Rock, um, but it's a longer, it's a longer boat trip, and this is a relatively short boat trip. It takes us about a half an hour to go five miles um, out to, to, uh, to egg, uh, egg rock. Well, what, what's the, the whole interest in on back to the about 100, to the turn of the century, 120 years ago? How many of you think we would find um, a lot more birds? in this area here? Or do you think we'd find about the same number of birds than we have now? There, there are carrying capacities and 
Or do you think we'd find many fewer birds back at the turn turn of the century, in late 1800s? Um, thumbs up. I can't see all of them. Many of you, I guess, maybe don't have your videos on, but um, if you can just think think about that, and um, if you would have more birds, fewer birds, or about the same birds. Well, if if you thought we would have um, a lot more birds, that's the wrong that's the wrong answer, and um, and you'll be uh, chastised for that. It'll be recorded. This this program is being recorded, I think. And so if you you put your thumbs down, um, uh, you are correct um, because we'd have a lot fewer birds. We would have almost no herring gulls, no blackback gulls, and our other populations would be down to one or two nests in places. And uh, one reason for that is the millinery trade. This is not a very good uh, photograph, but apparently back in the day, people thought it made women more attractive than they already are. I can't imagine that to wear a dead bird on their head, but uh, people did this. They not only used the feathers, they used the entire bird in many, in many cases. And it depleted many of our populations of, um, of birds that had um, attractive feathers for, um, for showing. A lot of the herons um, and uh, uh, our great blue herons, our snowy egrets uh, were all used. And several of our other, probably not as showy birds, were also were also used. So that really decimated uh, the population. Um, also, what really cut down on the population of many species of birds was egging. Uh, people would go out to these nesting uh, these nesting islands um, in small boats, few people at a time, off the coast of Maine. Egg Rock, appropriately named, was uh, uh, an island that they could get to only five miles off the coast. And the first thing that they would do during the nesting season, of course, they had nesting puffins, they had nesting guillemots, they had um, all the birds that are there now, um, laughing gulls, blackback gulls, and herring gulls, all the nest easily uh, available for pilfering. And the first thing they would do would be to addle all the eggs. They, they would uh, crush all the eggs, shake them, smash them, and they'd destroy all the eggs they could get their hands on. They would go back in three days and they knew that all of those eggs would be fresh because they had just destroyed all the eggs that they could get before. Then they would gather those and they, those were sold uh, along the coast in Portland, down down into the markets in, in Boston. So it doesn't take long um, to figure out if you're taking the birds' eggs and then you're taking the birds themselves for their feathers, uh, the population is not going um, not going to last. Well, uh, this gull here, the herring gull, made a prolific comeback. Um, <clears throat> turn of the century, they passed some laws to, uh, to prohibit um, some of the, uh, some of the egging. And um, it didn't take long for herring gulls to, uh, to just take over. And they really dominate the, uh, the coast because they shifted their food from the natural resource um, to garbage dumps, which is, you know, that's, it, it's a great strategy for an organism to be able to make those, uh, to make those shifts. Um, we have laughing gulls that are also on, um, on egg, egg rock, Eastern egg rock. Um, but they still feed on fish, and it took them a while to to come back. One of uh, one of the aids to these birds in building up their populations was the lobstering industry, that uh, that really took hold, and um, it became a, a marketable uh, prospect. To they used to just take lobsters, and they were sold for fertilizer, and um, and then they were somehow considered a delicacy and uh, that, that took the industry off. So there's a byproduct to, uh, to lobstering 
and that's to uh, throw the old bait out. And these gulls, blackbacks, herring gulls, um, really can support their population on much of our feeding. It's still like putting a bird feeder out. We, um, we, uh, we're, we're feeding these birds and that, uh, that continues. So, uh, so we have huge populations of, of nesting gulls along the main coast. The islands off the coast are somewhat, uh, some of them, somewhat free of mammalian predation. So this helps the gulls too. Another thing that helps the, the gulls is um, by being colonial nesters. Um, this is a great study. If you have any interest in birds, um, read a little bit about colonial nesting online. Um, Paul has a, a great essay in his book, um, The Birder's Handbook, a book I've mentioned a lot when I do, do programs. I think it's a great, it's a great book. Half of it is species accounts of where birds nest, how many eggs they have, um, uh, what their life history is. And it's not an identification guide, but it gives you all the information that you don't get in the identification guide. And in the second part of the book, he has essays on particular avian topics, uh, bird biology, ornithology topics. And um, he has a great essay on, on uh, colonial nesting. And the older birds, the more savvy birds, they get to nest in the center of the colony. They move into the center, which is more protected. And the design, there are a lot of different reasons. One reason for colonial nesting is that they can defend the colony better. With a lot of hands on deck, they can defend the, the colony better. Also, um, there's a, a part of colonial nesting that uh, saturates the predators. The outer margin is longer than the inner circle. So the birds in the outer margin, they might be first year nesters. They have a riskier time. Predators will come in. They might grab the first birds that they can get. So, so it's, um, it's, it's another advantage of, uh, of colonial nesting. A lot of birds and a lot to expend. And that's one reason why we find many, many species colonial nesting out on um, the, uh, the islands on the coast of Maine. Well, this is Egg Rock, Eastern Egg Rock. It's about seven acres, little interesting piece of real estate. You can see the vegetation is even more limited than the, um, than the rocky outer shore, but it's a perfect area for nesting seabirds. And as I said, it's about five miles uh, uh, the closest, uh, closest uh, to the main, mainland. And in the background, you can see Monhegan Island. It's about another, uh, another seven miles uh, out to, um, to Monhegan. So back in 1969, a young ornithologist uh, named uh, Steve Kress was working at Hog Island, which many of you know Hog Island. Some of you have been there. I used to teach. Um, Ornithology at Hog Island. Uh, it's a National Audubon uh, camp for birders, and uh, I directed a couple of a uh, couple of programs there over the years. And I met I met Steve in 1983, but he first joined um, as an instructor at Hog Island, uh, teaching about bird life. Young kid, back in uh, he was in his 20s, back in 1969. And he was reading in the, the, um, the fish house, which is the library at Hog Island. He was reading about the main coast. He was interested. And um, he started to read about puffins. And he was shocked to find that puffins historically had nested on Eastern Egg Rock, uh, the southernmost uh, nesting site. There was still some puffins up, in, uh, up at um, nesting in um, at, uh, Machaya Seal Island uh, in Matinicus Rock, Matinicus Island. And, and Steve was really surprised to find that they had nested there. And so he started to look at what the reasons were, why, why they weren't, why didn't they come back when these other birds came back? And um, one, one of the obvious reasons was that um, the gulls dominated Eastern egg rock at this point. There was just no room for anything else. 
in the gulls are predators on the puffins. So after a, a few years, um, he had pulled together his thoughts and he decided that he would try to reintroduce the Atlantic puffin to Eastern egg rock. Just, just an unbelievable story. Um, he wrote a great biography just a, just a few years ago um, uh, that tells the, the story in detail. But he looked at egg rock and he started dominated by gulls and he thought that possibly they could do something to uh, encourage these, these birds to come back. He didn't give much effort to, uh, to the downside that no seabird colony ever had been restored. Falcons had been restored, bald eagles had been restored through falconry practices, but a seabird colony, uh, a colony hadn't been, hadn't been restored. So he went about um, thinking how he could do this and he decided that he would um, deter the gull population and put in a population of puffins. He knew that puffins will come back to their natal colony four to five years after they fledge. So it made sense that if they didn't already have a colony there, it's kind of a catch 22. How do you get these birds back if you don't already have a source? If they're not coming back, it would have it would it would take a massive overpopulation of the other islands, which happens further north, for them to expand their range. But this colony, this far south, needed some help. So he went to Newfoundland in 1973 and brought back these puffin chicks. Um, he had only two interns with him uh, in the early uh, the early years, and they built burrows uh, on egg rock and fed these uh, these chicks as though they were they were being fed by their their parents they gave them vitamins little vitamin capsules um, and uh, the discouraging part of this project was that the puffins naturally when they fledge they go out to sea and they don't return to land for four to five years. So he was doing an experiment. The, he would not have any indication if it worked for four or five years. Um, this is a, this is a young puffin. Um, and the way, the way puffins uh, breed is uh, two puffins will, um, will, will hook up in a burrow and they lay one egg. Puffins only lay one egg and they only have one brood. And they'll feed this, this young chick uh, as much food as they possibly can. They fly out, both parents will fly back and forth uh, uh, after it's about, about 38 to 44 days that they have to incubate the egg. So one of them is always on the egg. And then after that, as a fledgling, they, they get fed continually by both parents. After that, the parents shut them off and they don't bring any food. They leave, they leave the nestling in the burrow and they leave. The parents leave and go to sea. After a couple of days of realizing, hey, mom is not coming home with, with the bacon, they stumble out of their burrows at night, stumble over those big boulders down into the Atlantic and they paddle out to sea and they won't return to land for four or five years. And that's what Cress um, witnessed there on, um, on, egg, on Egg Rock. And then in 1981, um, after bringing many more, he brought total over the, the, the course of the years, the projects have been going on, total of uh, just under a thousand puffin chicks to Egg Rock and released them. And uh, in 1981, um, a puffin showed up, came back to Egg Rock, and they didn't have any indication of breeding for another four years. So this 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 took a couple of decades um, in the uh, in the process. Now uh, Egg Rock uh, is a pretty inhospitable piece of land 
out in Muscongas Bay um, for us. Uh, I've been out there when it's really, really been quite a blow and it's a tough time this time of year right now. And these birds are there right now. And it's tough along the coast um, as far as weather goes. But uh, being in a burrow or under some rocks and boulders gives them, uh, gives them enough protection. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got this uh, process going on right now. And these birds are on eggs. They don't have any chicks yet, but they're on, they're on eggs. The puffins have some interesting adaptations. I'm always surprised that um, when people see puffins for the first time, they think they're much, they think they're much larger than, they should be much larger than they, they are. Um, they think they should be penguin size, um, but they're fairly, uh, they're fairly small. I think a lot of that is contributed to pictures like this. This looks like a pretty big bird, but puffin's only about uh, less than 12 inches tall. And, um, and they're, they weigh less than a pound. They're about the size of a football, just about the size of a football. And they, they have uh, this colorful beak only during the breeding season. And you can see how they, uh, they stack the fish. And it's more often than not, uh, tail on one side, then a head, tail on one side, then a head, tail on one side, then a head, back and forth. And these are diving birds. They dive and they swim into a school of fish and they catch up with the school of fish. They're very fast swimmers. They, they actually fly under, underwater with their wings. They'll swim, catch up to a school of fish, and then they turn their head to their left and open up their bill and grab a fish. And they have these little spikes at, at the top of the roof of their mouth and they tuck it up there to hold it. And then they swim further and they turn their head to the right. So now the fish that is swimming forward is, is going to present itself differently to the bill. So they left and right, left and right, left and right. And that stacks the fish in, in the bill. And they can fly quite comfortably without one slipping out. So they're pretty, uh, they're pretty darn uh, clever. And some of them are a little acrobatic um, when, you, uh, when you take a look. So Steve had come up with birds back. And he, he knew that uh, hunters up in Iceland use decoys to attract. And we use decoys for hunting ducks here um, and hunting geese but it had never been used for uh, seabirds here. But in Iceland, they used them because they, uh, they trap these birds. These, this is not a rare bird uh, as you get further north. And they're on many menus in, uh, in Iceland. You can go in and order a, you know, a meal of a puffin. So he incorporated puffins on Eastern Egg Rock uh, to see these birds out flying by and they see what looks like them and they they fly in so you can still see some some uh, decoys on uh, on the rock uh, on the rock today um, you can tell the difference you have to look closely often on the boat someone will say oh there's a puffin right there well you have to count the legs uh, decoys only have one leg and live living puffins have two so put mirrors out um, so that these birds would get a more lifelike representation of themselves. They could look back and say, hey, yeah, here I am, here, there's another, there's another one of me. Um, and uh, they're not sure exactly which uh, techniques work, but they used all of them. And those techniques now have been used to successfully reintroduce many different spe species of seabirds around the world. Um, it's, it's really an unbelievable um, process that started uh, right here on, on, egg, on egg rock. Um, one of the things that he used was um, sound recordings um, to attract these birds from, you know how sound carries over, over uh, the water a long distance and so that, uh, that helped. So we had these, uh, these puffins, adult puffins, after being at sea for four, sometimes five years coming back. And some of the birds that were showing up were not banded. As you can see, you can see here, no bands on these birds. They were just showing up because there was, um, uh, there was an amplification of the uh, colony taking place and attracting birds from, uh, from, from other, uh, uh, other native areas where they, they nested might've been uh, not suitable nesting areas now that have changed. So they came, uh, they came back. Chris eventually put out uh, the Egg Rock Hilton here uh, this is for the uh, 
uh, the interns, the puffineers that work, uh, they work out there. They don't sleep in this building, but they have their computers and they do their recording and they get together and have meetings in, in here. Um, this is another building that they don't sleep in. You can see the half uh, crescent moon on that and figure out what that's all about. But they sleep out in, uh, in tents. Um, and they're, they're out there right now monitoring um, the puffin uh, and, and all the turns um, from these blinds. And we'll be able to see, uh, see those. And here's uh, Dr. Crest here on the, uh, on the shore of the uh, Cruikshank uh, Sanctuary on, on, egg, on Egg Rock. All the turns are up. Um, again, they use the same, the same defenses. Nest in a colony of strength in numbers. And that can drive, uh, often drive some, um, some pretty hefty mammalian predators uh, uh, away. So the puffins have about a two foot wingspan. That's not, it's not very big, um, three feet. If you put your hand on your sternum and then your arm out to the right, that's about three feet. So you take a foot off that. It's not a very, not a very big, big bird. They've got um, big orange feet. Uh, uh, they're not great flyers, but they're great swimmers. This is a Gen 2 penguin we don't have in the um, Northern Hemisphere. And uh, macaroni penguin over here. And here's the, uh, the puffin, much, much smaller. And, uh, and here we have another auk. Puffins are, are um, in the, um, the alcid family. And uh, this is another, another uh, member of its family that they've tried to get nesting on egg rock because these birds nest at different elevations, slightly different nesting needs, and uh, they could live in, in harmony there. This is a razorbill, razorbill auk, and uh, this is a decoy of the razorbill that um, I think is still out on, on, egg, on egg rock. So, Egg Rock um, is a short distance out. It's worth uh, the trip. It's a real live, active seabird colony. Um, uh, these birds are fun to see. We don't get great views of them like this. This obviously is a view of a bird coming in to nest, uh, coming in towards the photographer. Um, but uh, some people have gotten some pretty good, uh, some pretty good shots from the boat. From a moving boat, it's challenging anyway. But it's not a photography trip, but it's an experience uh, in itself. So this is a great blackback gull. Some of you are familiar with the size of the great blackback gull, largest gull in the world, and it's uh, it's about to eat an adult, an adult puffin. They can open their mouth completely and swallow the bird. Not not you know the chicks. The chicks are protected in their burrow, but they can. Uh, the, the blackbacks really feed on just about anything. We also have another issue with predators, um, avian predators, great horned owls. It's nothing for them to fly from the mainland out and, um, and steal, steal uh, chicks at night. And this is particularly of um, a detriment to the tern population, more so than the, than the puffin population. So the predators, um, then we can get uh, bald eagles. It's a huge problem on the main coast right now. Uh, they're everywhere. You, everyone's, I mean, you're all seeing them right around North Conway. Um, we see bald eagles on, on a regular, regular basis. They, uh, they really have, uh, their populations have exploded and it's um, much to the detriment to our seabird, uh, seabird colonies. Um, there's one uh, great blue heron rookery uh, it used to be on Wreck Island, which was just a few islands in from Egg Rock, and that uh, that that heronry is fully decimated uh, by bald bald eagles. Bald eagles can can catch and devour a, a great blue heron, an adult great blue heron, and chicks are really easy for them to do. And I've seen video of eagles. Uh, taking one osprey chick after the next, after the next, until they're all, until they're all gone. Um, peregrine falcons, also big predator along the coast. This is, uh, this is a bird, not in great numbers, but they're pretty successful at feeding on what they want to feed on. And another one of our predators in the lower right, uh, black crown night herons, will, uh, will come in and can easily decimate uh, a population. 
And this, um, I don't know if you can see this, it seems like it might just be the tail. Oh no, there we go. I had to move my image of you guys. Uh, this is a mink and mink can, can easily swim in the ocean out to islands like egg, egg rock. And that's, a, that's an issue that the, um, the puffin ears are, are, um, are really on top of. So let's look at the numbers here before our wrapping up a little bit. 1981, um, they, uh, they started to show, show up on, uh, on egg, egg rock and uh, started, started nesting in 1981. Four years prior to that, uh, they had the very first one that almost didn't even count. And uh, now in, uh, uh, in later years, they're up to 123 pairs. Now, um, this, this last record that I have, the last um, uh, data is from 2017. That was 172 pairs. I think that close to 200 pairs uh, now. So uh, it's really been an amazing story, amazing recovery. Um, so successful. And Crest was somewhat criticized um, for spending all the time and effort for bringing back just a cute little bird that really is quite abundant as you get further north. But the tools that he developed doing this have expanded to many, many endangered um, birds all, all around the country, um, all, all around the world, actually. Uh, there are albatross that are reintroduced to Hawaii. Uh, there are uh, terns in Japan that they've reintroduced. So it's, it's really a great, um, a great uh, successful operation. Always uh, in, until just recent years, there's been a question of where, where the puffins uh, spend the non-breeding season. As I said, they, they wander down into the, into the ocean uh, when, when they're just um, a little over a month old, 44 years, 44 days old. They wander down and they don't come back to land for, for four years. Um, they've been seen uh, out in the North Atlantic, but they they didn't really know quite where they uh, where they went, and so they they tried to put some telemetry on these these birds, but it was such a long time um, for satellite telemetry that would send back their position um, a long time that they were out. They 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 it, the batteries couldn't last for the for the four years. So so. In recent years, I don't know, probably about five, six years ago, maybe a little bit more, they they put on these sensors on the puffins that they released at Egg Rock, and the sensors monitor the amount of daylight that the bird is experiencing, and it works a little bit like a, a GPS. They can they can um, they can take the data and interpret it. And tell where the bird is on a certain date. And so it gives you a path. The problem with, with this, and it's not a problem, but um, one of the shortcomings is the bird has to return so that they can take this uh, geolocator and download the data. And that, that's, that's happened. Um, and they put them on, uh, they put them also on, uh, on turns, on Arctic turns, which have this incredible, you can see one here, they have this incredible uh, migration. They use the decoys uh, for turns. They use the sound studies for encouraging the turns to come back. The decoys were so successful. Um, often they could, they could see live adult um, male Arctic turns um, displaying to the wooden decoy offering a fish. Um, and she never really responds. It's heartbreaking. Um, so he moves on and finds somebody a little bit more willing. Some uh, have been even photographed uh, trying to copulate with the wooden decoys. So the decoys have been pretty successful, not as far as any reproduction, of course, but uh, successful at is attracting the birds back to the back to the colony. And they don't have to be any sophisticated, really sophisticated decoys. Uh, just the, the predominant field marks is enough to get these birds to, uh, to recognize and display too. 
Rosia terns here, um, really a small population, endangered rosia tern, handsome, handsome bird. And um, you can usually pick these out uh, from, uh, from the boat. We also have another bird that we won't see uh, that nests on egg rock, and that's in the upper, upper left. Um, this is leeches, storm petrels. Uh, storm petrels are about the size of a swallow. They're small seabirds, um, probably one of the most common birds in the world. Um, they stay out at sea most of the time, um, and they nest in burrows. So the leeches, storm petrel here in the left, uh, uh, nest in burrows and they're nocturnal. So you don't see them coming and going and they'll go out. Sometimes they'll fly over 200 miles to get fish uh, uh, to feed, bring back and feed uh, their, uh, their young in the burrows. The bird down on the, the right, uh, there's a chance, I've seen them before on our trips. They don't nest on egg rock, they don't land on egg rock, but they're very much a pelagic bird. And this is the Wilson storm petrel and they nest in South America and they're here for their winter. Um, storm petrels, they get their name um, petrel from Peter, from St. Peter. They patter their feet along the surface of the water um, as, they, uh, as they feed. And being a petrel, they have a little tube nose. You can see this, very, very small. That tube nose is how uh, petrels can, can drink salt water and they excrete the salt out of that tube. Lots of different types of uh, petrels. We also have nesting laughing gulls. Uh, the laughing gulls nest in more of the vegetation on the island. They don't cause the puffins or the terns any any uh, any issue. And the uh, egg rock is the largest uh, colony of of uh, laughing gulls on the main uh, on the main coast. Vegetation is an issue. Um, part of the uh, management is to pull up vegetation, clear spaces for the terns, cover vegetation so that it doesn't, uh, so that it doesn't grow and get out, out of hand. Um, so it, it, the, the recovery project is not easy. It's not just you get the puffins to come back and everything's good. It has to be maintained. And um, uh, little nesting, protected homes uh, has helped the, uh, the tern population. Uh, to defend against uh, predators. It's worked out very well. And this is a common turn, and we'll see many of these on uh, the rock. Steve came up with the idea of uh, Robo Ranger a number of years ago, and they, uh, they designed this at Cornell University, and he lives in that coffin there, and at certain times, he will come up out of the box and scare the, scare the predatory gulls away. It, it never really worked. The last time I saw um, Robo Ranger, he was, uh, he didn't have a, a rifle anymore. He was just standing, uh, his, his box had been removed. He's just standing out there and someone had put an Arnold Schwarzenegger mask on, on him. So it's kind of a bizarre, kind of a bizarre um, sighting on Egg Rock and for these birds. Remember, this is on the southern edge of their nesting range, and the water definitely is warming. Um, these, these puffins can feed on this size fish, but the youngsters can't. Uh, that's butterfish on the right. I, I don't know what that is on the left, but it's not the source of food that will sustain a puffin population. So they have to have the right type of fish in order to, uh, to sustain. And uh, that presently is uh, is an issue for these young these young uh, young chicks. Uh, they just don't have a big enough uh, gape, a big enough mouth yet to feed on on those. So it's important that uh, the rangers are out there. Um, there is uh, some video, um, some webcam, not from Egg Rock yet that I'm aware of, but Seal Island, which is an island uh, north of Egg Rock. And I thought um, in closing, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd see if we can tap into to, um, to this. Is that working? Can you see that? All right, good. So this, this is live. This is on Seal Island. 
Um, that's a nesting puffin. It's on the it's on the egg. Um, it looks like it's probably sleeping, but I'll give you the link for this. And it's really fun to every once in a while just go on and see what they see what they're doing. There's another another webcam that uh, just has a, a loafing ledge where the the birds are hanging out, you know, talking about you know breeding and whatever else they they talk about and uh, what they did this uh, this past winter, and that's fun to fun to watch. So I'll put a link in uh, in for for this, but I think it's it's pretty much amazing. You can hear. And there's only one sound that puffins make. And uh, earlier they were they were making this um, they were making this this sound. And I'll uh, I'll play that recording for you. It's only it's vocalization that is only used in the in the burrow. See if I can get this. Sounds like a chainsaw but it's an Atlantic puffin. So it's a good thing this sleeping puffin can't hear this because he'd think there was some disturbance going on. I hope he can't hear it. I hope he's not watching the program. Um, well, let me get back to... Uh, where we were, if I can. So this is the boat that uh, we'll be taking out in uh, in in June, and uh, I still have uh, places available. We have a, a a trip on the 23rd that many have signed up for. It's actually full. Uh, that's on the 23rd of June. It's a Thursday. And I've, uh, I've got another trip the very next day on the 24th, and I still have openings. I've got about 20 openings left for that, uh, for that venture. And anyone that is interested can send me an email uh, at chris at ravenprograms.com. And, um, and I'll, I'll give you more, uh, more information. It's a short trip. We're out for uh, less than a couple of hours. It's uh, about an hour and a half to two hours drive north of Portland. We'll, we'll see, we should see all the nesting birds there, except the petrel. And it's, we often are surprised by seeing some other, other seabirds. So the trip that's available is Friday, June 24th. Um, that link, is at the top of the page here, the YouTube link for the uh, for the puffin uh, the puffin cam. Any um, any questions? That was kind of a long winded introduction. All right, Chris, thank you so much for that. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in through the chat, so um, so I'm going to start just by by asking those of you. Um, those questions to you, the first of which is, um, and you may have said this, but what is, um, what is the actual, what is the size of the current um, colony on, or I guess last year, you know, but the at last check, like approximately what is the size of um, the puffin colony on Eastern Egg Rock? Last year's data and COVID threw things off a, a little bit, but it's been steadily increasing and it might have plateaued a little bit. And so we had a problem with the data collection and a problem because of COVID. And then we also have a problem with, um, with the sea temperature rising. So I, I don't know, but on board this, um, both of these trips, um, Pete Salmonson, who's worked on the Puffin project for since it started, uh, will be on board and he'll have all the, uh, the latest, uh, latest details for us. He'll be on board during, during doing the um, narration for us along with, uh, along with myself. So I encouraged him to come and he's, uh, he's 
put out several books and articles on on Puffin. So, so it's a it's it's a good trip, and we should have all the all the latest details of what's uh, what's going on. Okay, and I, I know you know for sure, but yeah. So what you showed the 1981 to 2010. Um, the graph of that growing, you know, sort of that steady increase. Um, is there an estimate as to what the carrying capacity for, um, you know, for that rock is? Is it, you know, I, you mentioned, you know, it might be starting to plateau at this right. point. Right, right. So it's high. That's a great. That's a great question. The carrying capacity, because they really don't. They really don't know. There aren't enough records of what it was naturally. Um, and Steve, uh, Steve doesn't know. I've talked to him about, about this. So they don't know if it's plateauing off because it's going to go into a decline because of the, the lack of suitable fish or it's plateauing off because it's reached its, its, uh, its capacity. Of course, the carrying capacity would, would be the nesting colonies or um, I think you froze a little bit, but hopefully you'll be. Come back. I know. Hmm. Give him a minute. I know, we'll give him a minute because then Lori, I had a similar question to yours when he was talking about that mix. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a long way to swim five miles from shore. Five miles, yeah. I mean, even an, even a... Oh no, did we lose him? Oh, nope, there he is. Chris, oh, Chris, you got to unmute yourself. There. All right. I don't know what happened. That, that's okay. Welcome back. Um, so Lori and I were just saying we had, uh, we had similar questions and that was, I think. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good one. Often the, uh, good, but this, uh, this, that was a good one. But uh, no, that wasn't our question. No, no, we have another, <laughs> yeah, that was, I'm not taking, I can't take credit for that. But, uh, you know, I, so you're you mentioned that a mink can easily and will easily swim five miles out. Um, or are they coming from other islands? Or are they coming from? Yeah, I mean, how far? Well, the, the the closest land is um, uh, five from the mainland is it, it's five it's five miles. There are other islands, but the other islands aren't suitable for you know. There's not a whole lot of food for mink unless they're just island hopping along um, well, yeah, which could be i just yeah. remember seeing a mink on the coast and it totally blew me away i yeah. just wasn't expecting it it was the rocky you know coast yeah. that we weren't on an island but even at that yeah. I was, wow you know yeah. they can well understand. you know the the deer are great swimmers they they swim out to you know monhegan monhegan's got a big population of deer and they got there somehow um, I've talked to fishermen that have seen them out away from land. You can't see any land and they're out swimming around. Um, so well, that and the fact that it's also salt water too. You know, it's not, that's just, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. huh. All right, wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, yeah, always, we always have some odd behavior um, that's expressed in the human population quite often, you know, um, so, uh, you know, people expand their range, like people that go up and live in Randolph, you know, things like, things like that. That's, you know, it's expanding the range of the human uh, population. But yeah, that is surprising. I think it's really surprising. You have a mink that would swim out there for, uh, but if the, the rewards are good enough, yeah, estimate the entire population, eggs, young uh it's good eating out there yeah hmm. yeah so so chris here is a question for you what is what is the most interesting or surprising thing you've seen on on one of these trips out to eastern egg rock oh let me see what uh, i assume that's a species of animal <laughs> yes yes I was gonna say okay. It was okay. probably me because okay. I get really seasick, and I yeah, went. That, that is, um, there is a little bit of an issue with uh, we we call it barking at the buoys. When, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
I when was someone, fun, is, right? someone is off off the off the stern. But uh, for the most part, it's a short trip, and and uh, and well, we enough said about uh, about about that. But as far as species of um, birds, we've had uh, northern fulmars out there. I just saw last week. I saw thousands of northern fulmars. I was off the coast of Greenland uh, last uh, last week, and I had only seen a few out around Eastern Hag Rock before. Um, so it was really uh, great to see them off. And that's what's fun about seeing birds nesting on a seabird island. You, you get to really, um, you know, so many of us, you know, we, we have the book and we're looking and we're identifying new birds that we haven't seen before. Then after you see them over and over again, you don't identify them, you recognize them. And, and that, that's, a, a, it, that's rewarding in our own, uh, our own little uh, birding world uh, to just see something and, oh, yeah, that's a that's a northern fulmar. Uh, so northern fulmars, uh, razor bills are often seen during the month of May, and that's a that's that's a great bird to to see. Um, uh, we'll see all the all the usual suspects. Um, sometimes we'll see um, spotted sandpipers. They nest on the island. Also, um, we could see whales, easily harbor seals, um, uh, sometimes dolphins all nose dolphins so um yeah it's different it's different all all the time and i've got some folks that are coming on both trips uh, both the uh, thursday and friday trip um because it's it'll uh it'll it'll be different oh we also had a jaeger out there one year we had a long tail jaeger um which is another northern bird that you know i just don't see a whole lot of so that was uh, that was that was fun it's it's always fun to you know be surprised by be surprised by something um and and there was there was a question about the trip um whether does the boat go out regardless of of weather yeah um we've in the last seven years we've only canceled once and it's up to the captain and it's not if it's if it's drizzling we'll still go out but it's up to the uh the seas if it's if it's not safe for uh, for the boat, if it's safe for the boat, then we have to put up with it, and so that's that's the plan. Which makes it difficult if we're you know a couple of hours north of Portland to to get to. And some people come the night before, and then you know. So it's only happened once. There it goes again. Oof. Must be getting late in Chatham. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's going. That's right. Pretty soon it'll just go offline. But it was that it was, it was that severe. Uh, yeah. was pretty no no question. And then we ended up going. Uh, we went the next day, and it, it was gorgeous. It was a just right. a great a great day. So um, so that's a you know that we'll have to see how that goes. But for the most part, we we go we go rain or shine. Okay, wonderful. Um, if unless anyone has any other questions, um, Chris, thank you so much for. Thanks. That was uh, that was fun, and I hope to for this program. You. Um, that's great, and hopefully, we'll you know I know some of you on here are are signed up for birding in the bog, and um, yeah, Saturday on Saturday, Saturday Chris be, uh, will be joining be us a fun a fun guest host. Uh, so, um, yeah, so thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, hopefully we will see you on um, on a program soon. Ignore, don't, don't end the program. I want to talk to my mom. <laughs> <laughs>